What is that food? Is it a lychee? <laughs> no, I don't know what it is. It looks like an alien. <laughs> Give it a little taste. Welcome back to my channel, my friends. I'm in Bangkok right now. I spent the last week, no, 10 days in Koh Tao, which is a remote island off the coast of Thailand, where I was teaching and coaching some of you. Now I'm just like here in Bangkok for a couple of days before I fly over to LA for another meetup. So that's very exciting, but my whole brain is like, what time is it? I thought after a week, maybe 10 days since I filmed my last video, that my voice would get a little bit better, but it's just not going away. So I don't know. I'm kind of digging it though. It kind of gives it like a sexy vibe. Too much of anything is not good for you, baby. This video is going to be a Q&A, so I'm curious as to what you guys are thinking about. So it's going to be a big chit chat, and we're also going to address the elephant in the room, which is what happened to my lip. And I'm going to tell you this story right now because quite a few of you guys asked me. Basically, I'll give you the setting. We were cliff jumping, beautiful in Thailand, and one of the girls, Seikon, she jumped in and her watch came off. So I was like, great. I love retrieval services. So I went in with my mask and I was like, went to the bottom, grabbed the watch. It was quite deep, um, but I'm not gonna blow my own trumpet. And I got the watch, I was like, great. And then I was looking around me, it was beautiful, like coral reef everywhere, peacefully coming up to the surface. And then, bush, Mario jumps literally right on top of me and I bit my own lips. It was quite traumatic. I got a little bit scared. So did you, innit, Mario? You had <laughs> like, to calm me down. <laughs> yeah, Mario had the biggest guilt conscience. Like, every time he looked at me, he, he, he just couldn't take it. So that's what happened to my lip. But we're all good now, and we'll just get straight into it. Every time I do a Q&A, I always get questions about whether I'm on the pill and what kind of contraception I use. So I am currently taking nothing. We use condoms and that works really well for me. I was previously on the pill when we first got together. This is like seven years ago, nearly eight years ago. And it just, it really wasn't, it really wasn't working. In the first two months, I gained like five kilos and I'd say half of that went straight to my boobs. Like I was a B cup, I had, I don't really have boobs. And then just, like it was just, it was crazy. And it really hurt. I mean, Mario wasn't complaining because, you know, kind of like a porn star, but can I say, it just really wasn't working for me. And also I used to get mad mood swings. I just didn't feel myself. You know, when they have those Snickers adverts, it's like, you're not yourself. If you, it's like, get some nuts. Like you're not yourself if you haven't got a Snickers or I don't know what they're advert is but basically I just wasn't myself and also when I was on the pill they put me on the pill because I wasn't having my own period so that's also not that great because it masks you being able to have a period naturally it's important to know that your body is having a natural period and if you can't have a period by yourself then you have to take necessary steps to get that back but the pill is just a way of masking that, so that's not really a solution. Whilst we're on the topic of periods, I also get asked so much whether you should train when you're on your period, what do you do if you have PMS, and to be honest, like, I think just listen to your body. If you really feel like shit, then take it easy on yourself. Don't push yourself through a workout just because it's written in your plan. Like, I think that's why it's important to have a plan that's quite flexible. For me, like I know that when I'm on my period, the first half day, mm -mm, it's basically like a write off because I'm in so much pain. Even when I take paracetamol, it doesn't really settle anything. I just have to lie down, put a hot water bottle and just see it through and I'm not gonna train. But then the rest of my period, I still train and I can still really push myself. Is set weight true? That's a really good question. Actually, quite a few of you guys asked me this and it is something that a lot of people are talking about at the moment. So the set point theory is the idea that your body will fight to maintain its weight within a particular range. So if you're trying to lose weight, then your body will put in place mechanisms to try and maintain your body at that higher weight. I personally still have a lot of questions to do with set point theory. So if someone's obese, like, does that mean that it's basically impossible for them to lose weight and then maintain a healthy weight? Is their body always gonna be fighting for them to be obese? Like, I don't understand 
that element of it. But on the other hand, I have made videos that show that our bodies are really good at stabilizing in the short term. So if you guys are interested in that topic, then someone write a comment about it. And if you are interested, then just like that comment so that I know how many people are interested in this topic and I'll do a full science explained video. Can you talk more about your Ironman training? I'm doing one next year. Oh, I've actually had a few questions about my Ironman. My Ironman was the last time I shat my pants, if I'm honest. Like, that's the last time I shat my pants. And that's all you need to know. Like, next question. The Ironman was something that I can't really compare anything else to. It's such a long event. You spend a long time with yourself and it takes so much like resilience mentally that I feel like if you can do that, you can do anything. I was 18 when I first started doing triathlon and I was like, I wanna do an Ironman. And I worked for three years working up my way through like sprint to Olympic distance to half Ironman to Ironman distance. And it was just a great experience. I mean, I wasn't the only one to shit my pants. Every toilet that I went through was already like, on the ceilings. I mean, I just don't understand. One thing I will say though, when it comes to training for your Ironman, is not to get sucked up in, I have to just train more and more and more. Just be really smart with your training. You don't need to clock up hundreds of hours in a month so that you can actually take time to recover and give your body time to recover. Like, if I'm honest, like I think I just did way too much training. If you, this is a great question, if you could know the absolute truth to one question, what question would you ask? I think I need some time. That's not a question you can just straight off the bat ask. <sighs> I've given it a little bit of thought. I think. The one question I'd want to know the absolute truth to is how do we make contact with aliens? I'm just, there are many questions I'd love answered. I actually can't think of a question. I can't think of one that I really like. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the audience. So you guys write down a question that you'd want the absolute truth to and I will pick the one that I like the most and give you a free training guide. Whichever training guide you like, because I, I need to ask the audience at this point. So get thinking. Any mentality tips that helped you to get over food stigmas like low fat or low carb, etc.? That's a really good question. But honestly, I feel like all of the stigmas that I used to kind of have kind of went away the more educated I became. So the more I used to read up on scientific literature, well-conducted studies about those things, the more I realized that they were just kind of like myths that had kind of been misinterpreted. If you don't have a scientific qualification or you're not comfortable reading scientific literature, then just be mindful of who you're getting that information from. So listening to medical doctors, registered dietitians, which are not the same as nutritionists, especially in the UK. Getting your information from those people is really important because when they give you a dietary approach, they understand the whole body, like the whole system. So everything that's going on biochemically. And so when you hear something about low carb, like it might help in one instance, but then we're not considering any of the biochemistry and any of the hormones that might be implicated. Registered dietitians and medical doctors know that, and they know that over the long term it can have implications on your health. Even when it comes to me, like don't listen to me just because it's me. I work with registered dietitians and I read papers that are well conducted in dietetics, but that doesn't mean that you should take my word as gospel. So yeah, I think it's just important to think about who you're letting yourself be influenced by around food. What song is currently stuck in your head? <sighs> and that song is thanks to Mario over here because he's a Liverpool fan. How did you balance uni and training? I want to be a beefcake but studying's ruining my fun. If I'm being honest, like when it came to uni and training, like I trained when I could, but I went to uni to get my degree. And so in times like that, like I am realistic with myself and I know that I can't have everything 
all the time in that moment. So I focus on one thing, I shift my attention, get my degree, get the results that I wanted, and then I go back to training how I want to train. And I kind of go in and out of things rather than trying to clump them all together. Because in the end, I end up doing a bad job at both. The way to kill something is to really dedicate your time to it and focus on it. And by definition, you can't be dedicated to two things at once. I spent two months of the year really focusing on revising. And then once my exams were over, then I could move back to training and focus more on my training. In the end, like the gym's always gonna be there. But being at uni only comes around like, kind of like once in a lifetime. When is your next cheat day? I can't remember the last cheat day I posted. I think it's well over a year now. I don't do cheat days anymore. If I want a burger, if I want fries, then now and again, I will have those things. Like I eat about 20% of my diet is more like treat food, like foods that aren't necessarily the most nutritious. And that works really well for me because that means that if I do fancy something small, then I'll eat it and then I don't worry about it and I'm not thinking about it and I don't make it this whole big cheat day. I feel like having that approach to food the way I did before kind of made me think about food way more. Now I don't even think about food. I don't build it up to be anything, like I don't get FOMO around food and I know what I'm feeling, like something might look really good and it probably tastes amazing but if I'm not feeling it, I'm not feeling it. It works really well for my lifestyle so no more cheat days. Do you have a tongue piercing? No. Do you ever feel the pressure to look a certain way since you're a fitness vlogger? Lots of love. Ah, oh, love back. Okay, so I think I'm gonna break this question down because I think there's two parts to it. There's how I personally feel and then my image as a content creator in fitness. So how I personally feel, I don't feel any pressure. Like I'm very comfortable in my own skin. And to be honest, like I don't feel like I'm changing my diet to look a particular way. Like I'm very comfortable eating the way I do and I'm not really thinking about it. You okay, Mario? <coughs> <No>. <coughs> I learned a long time ago that how other people look and how I compare to that doesn't affect my happiness. So I, so no, I don't personally feel pressure. However, I am very realistic about how we behave as people. So before I even open my mouth, before I talk about my qualifications, before I talk about science, before I show any of my athletic capabilities, I know that we are very quick to judge because we're trying to shortcut decision making. The first piece of information that anyone has about me is how I look and that decision process is happening before I've had a chance to show you who I am. So in that sense, I know that how I look is important because subconsciously we are very quick to make those decisions and it gives me credibility. I want to spread a healthy message around fitness to as many people as possible and I know that that first of all takes something that is eye-catching for people to feel like they can trust me. Being that the internet is what it is, how do you handle it when people leave hateful messages slash comments? You guys are so, so supportive and it's very rare that I get anything like hateful or any nasty comments on my social media or my channel. But even if there is something that we don't agree on, like I've said something and you're like, ah, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. I love that. Like, I think it's really important to have discussions on things that are a little bit controversial or something that we don't necessarily agree on. Those comments and those discussions are done in a really respectful way. But then sometimes when my videos do go beyond my audience, like I can get some more like judgmental comments. But what I tend to do is I try and clear up that missing piece of information or that misjudgment in a really fair and honest way and often like that person will reply being like oh I'm sorry I didn't realise and then they'll end up subscribing so I think sometimes it's nice to still have a place on the internet where the discussion is still quite healthy. I also think it's important to realise that sometimes there's hate and sometimes it's just a question of preference like people telling me that they don't like my eyelashes it's just preference, like it's not really hate, it's just, yeah, I try not to be too sensitive when it comes to anything like that because being different is what makes us different, so yeah. Maybe I'll tattoo my ass. <laughs> being different is what makes us interesting. Get that on your ass. <laughs> on the other cheek. <laughs> on the other cheek. What did you think was cool then when you were young but isn't cool now? 
Okay, when, when I was younger, I thought it was really cool to have your belt. Like, it, it, was, it was a fashion belt, okay? It wasn't like a belt that was functional in any means. But basically, I used to wear a top. I used to wear a top. And then I used to wear a belt just, <laughs> just under my boobs. No, you did not. You didn't. What, on your top? What, what, what was it? So what kept your trousers up? <laughs> my, my trousers used to be really low. But then you used to have a belt that was like literally just here. No, you didn't. <laughs> I swear I did. I don't, I don't actually think anyone in my school wore that either. I think that was just unique to me. I thought it was cool. One of the things that I've realised that I think is really cool that I didn't think was cool back then was just to be your own person and to be passionate about something. And I think when you find something that you really connect with and you're really passionate about, like other people see that and they feel that energy and that's cool. And I think the difference is I used to think that what was cool was dependent on other people's perception but now I just kind of realise that what's cool is not based on anything other than just how you are and what you're interested in and how passionate you are about something. So we need to go because I have a meeting right now so I'm going to end the video and I'm going to give you a big big hug from Bangkok. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to comment down below the question you want the absolute truth to. So yeah, I love you guys. Bye!